might look like I'm nervous because I am. <laughs> <laughs> Just a couple of things. I'm going to try and make this as interactive as possible. So I'm going to draw, I mean, that really is down to how you guys also engage. So I mean, I've got all the answers on the slide. But, I mean, that's not the point. <coughs> um, so and also one thing, I sometimes mumble. So if, if I start mumbling, or you're mumbling. Just checking. <laughs> exactly. So if I start mumbling, then just let me know. Okay. And uh, sometimes I get really excited and really passionate about this field, and my, the pitch of my voice goes really high. So if you think that you're listening to a Dell CD, stop me. <laughs> Even though you think it's good, just stop me, and I'll try and bring my pitch down to to a normal talk. Okay. So a bit about me, um, as Lime said. Uh, and before anybody asks, my beard really is as soft as it looks. <laughs> How do you do that, Paul? <laughs> uh, well, it's a combination of Biffles, Fontaine, Bart, with it, <laughs> and uh, Bonafide Balm Oil. You can ask Christy about that. Um, okay, so yeah, um, I got into digital forensics when I, uh, I was watching a program that used to be called, uh, I think it was called, uh, first it was called Forensic Files, and then it was called Medical Detectives, or vice versa first medical detectives. And I saw a case about um, about the bone torture kill, Dennis Radner, bone torture kill murderer that, that wreaked havoc from the 70s through to the 90s when he was caught. And he was caught through metadata. They analyzed the metadata of a file on a stiffy drive, a three and a half, three and a half inch um, stiffy drive, <coughs> and they saw that person who had edited the file, uh, it was at a certain church, they looked up whose who's name's Dennis on at the church and then they found him that by using NCASE which is a forensic software tool, they could just, I mean, but you didn't even need a forensic tool to analyze the metadata, I mean, you just right click properties and the metadata is there. Uh, I'm not going to be touching on metadata tonight, if I rush through this stuff then we uh, do have another presentation on metadata. I love metadata. That's just what it is. Um, Lime actually got me into digital forensics at UCT. He did the course before I did, and he told me how much he enjoyed it. So that's why I actually went into it. Um, and yeah, as he says, I've gone up to my masters. I mean, probably I'm probably crazy enough to do my doctorate, but at this stage I'll probably like to spend some more time on my music. Okay, so let's jump in. I'll just show you what the agenda is. Okay, so we're going to go through. What is forensics? Um, if you have any questions, please put up your hand. Uh, this is the kind of flow of where we're going to. There's a pretty cool, there's nice speakers here. We've got a nice video which actually ties all this stuff up. Uh, it's actually from a British duo, a comedy duo. It's a sketch that they did. But it, I mean, I think, I think it sums up exactly what we're going to be covering now. So that's why I'm going to show it. I'm really nervous. Uh, okay, so, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what is forensic? The history of forensics as a science, uh, history of computer forensics and how it evolved into digital forensics, um, computer-based e electronic evidence, scientific method, CSI effect, chain of custody, and just a quick overview of the digital forensic process. Just as a matter of fact, who, who, who does forensics or is in, uh, is exposed to type of this, this type of stuff? Any assist admins, you do it? Yeah. Um, generally, I've been doing it for a while. I don't get paid for it, but uh, it's, yeah. it's uh, yeah. I'm doing it for my stuff in the UK. Okay. And then I'm going to be here to help some people out with their mistakes. Okay, cool. Fantastic. Help me out if I say anything wrong. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> okay, so I really wanted to be interactive. Uh, yeah, in front as well. Okay, so let's jump in. So what is forensics? Anybody? Doesn't have to be the right answer. We did what? We did what? Yeah, we did what? And then, what? but more important, you need to be able to have forensics. It's, if you look at the definition, what it's defined as, the Oxford Dictionary defines it as, it's, a, it's based of Latin, forensis, which means for the court, or, um, open public, open court public. This is key. Okay, so, so that's what it means. So that's forensic is a science. So 
something about forensic, and we'll probably go over this a couple of times, it needs to firstly be reliable and needs to be valid. Okay, so <clears throat> that is what, that's what makes a science. A science is anybody can take the same, the, the same amount of, or the same evidence, and they should get, come to exactly the same conclusion. If they come to a different conclusion, then you need to understand why that, why that happens. Okay, yeah, if it looks like I'm reading from the slides. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so evidence collected it should be used following um, scientific principles. And that's where we're moving today, going through the history and then obviously getting to where <coughs> computer forensics is actually a science, um, as we know today. Okay, so the history of forensics, it goes back, and this will, you'll see this in the, in the video, it goes back to the cavemen, where they, where they used to protect their, their home and their family. So this is, this is not something new, it, was never, it wasn't called forensics back then. Um, on the previous slide you saw it went back to the 17th century. Um, <clears throat> okay. okay, so what type of forensics are you familiar with? If you've seen it on TV, just a couple of examples. Anyone? CSI? <laughs> well, what type of forensics from yeah. CSI? Fingerprints. Yeah. Fingerprints, yes. DNA. DNA. Hair. Okay, exactly. I mean, that's exactly what it is. It's, there's loads of different disciplines, and a lot of them are in the, in the last uh, 200 odd years. Um, so, the Francis Galton, I'm just going to uh, whiz through these. So, I mean, if you want to stop me. And there's obviously blood type grouping before the before DNA came along. Um, ballistics and document examination. I, I for, for, for the life of me, I can't remember what docu <laughs> what type of forensic document examination is called. But I'll, I'll get I'll, I'll figure it. Out. Been playing, bothering me the whole day. <laughs> there's a name for it. Um, okay, so Hans Gross. This this guy is often referred to as the founder of the field of criminal, criminalistics. What he did was he took all these, all these principles, or all these different types of forensics, and he put them together to when looking at a case, and it's uh, completely right. Okay, so, and then in 1932, the FBI set up a lab. Um, everybody knows J. Edgar Hoover. I won't go into that discussion by itself. You know, whether he was a good guy, bad guy, whatever. Live with his mom, can't be um, okay, the DNA, this is probably the, one of the biggest breakthroughs that, that we're all familiar with. We've, we've always thought that it's been around for years, but I mean, it only goes back to 1985. And it's hard to believe that. Before 1985, there's no such thing as DNA. Um, a guy called Alex Jeffries, 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 <coughs> he uh, from Leicester University, it was used to catch a criminal who killed two, um, two teenagers. Um, he also did a lot of uh, cases with immigration um, before it was used for the first criminal case. And as a result, Colin Pitchfork was found guilty for the murders and he was sent to 30 years in prison. He was actually eligible for parole last year. I don't think he got it. <laughs> it's not safe to be released. Okay. So the history of computer, computer forensics. Do you have any idea of how far computers go back and where, where uh, forensics started. Welcome. Any other, just throw it in there. 70s. 70s. 60s. 60s. Yeah? 1989. 1989. Yeah, well, well, it's before that. But yeah, it dates back to the 50s and 60s. And a lot of people in this room are coders. It's, um, I mean, it still happens today. Uh, coders sharing code amongst themselves. And, uh, this is what was one of the big problems, is no one could actually come up with what defines computer crime. Okay. Okay, so the first recorded crime actually goes back to 1958. Um, it, was a, it was a non guilty verdict. Um, first criminal prosecution was 1966. There were two um, cases. The first one was uh, 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 an employee altering bank records. The second one, was some poor guy called Hancock. He was found guilty of copying 58 um, different programs from Texas Instruments. Um, and then <coughs> from here, this is really when it started to become more, um, more of a science. They would start to look at uh, having definitions and stuff. 
So Hancock versus the state. Um, Hancock's going to be like this first guy that Microsoft really goes after for copyright. So, uh, but you'll have your name up on slides and stuff. So <laughs> too bad. <laughs> we'll never be able to own a car or a house again, but that's not good. Okay, so the, co the court rule that computer uh, programs um, fell under all writings. Um, okay, so any written document, so that's what they found it as. Um, and then classification. Okay. Sorry, I just moved. Okay. And then that was argued that it was too broad. Um, and uh, it's obviously just approach to protect people's property. Okay, so we're getting more to your date there, 1987. <laughs> okay, so um, <coughs> Don Parks, he's, he's pretty clever. He's one of the, the leading forensic examiners in the world. Um, in 1980, uh, 1979, he, um, this is obviously the evolution, so it's going to be going through a lot. Okay, so, oops. So, so computer crime is described <laughs> as illegal, um, legal computer abuse. Okay. And it doesn't necessarily, uh, it means that the computer has been used to, uh, commit, the to commit the crime. Okay, um, computer-related crime is defined in, as a broader term, and it means knowledge of a computer to commit the crime. Um, and lastly, computer abuse is defined as an intentional act where one or more purpose persons intentionally made use of computer to attempt to gain access that resulted or could have resulted in loss to victims. Okay, so that was obviously trying to come up with a term that everyone could agree on um, and <laughs> then we carry on. Okay, so in the United Kingdom they defined any fraudulent behavior connected to with a computerized system as intent to gain dishonest advantage, so hacking or through bank records. Okay, any questions? What are those examples you said on the right now? Sorry. Which examples? You said no. Alright, well, okay. such as hacking and... Um, I'll actually go, sorry, I'll, I spoke out of turn. I will, I will, I'll be moving to, to some examples um, as we're going. This is obviously the, the history of, of where the definitions come from and, and moving from computer crime to where it's now referred to as digital events. But uh, I'll get to some... But it's, so what? essentially... Computer forensics started with <coughs> copyright, people taking code that was copyrighted by Texas Instruments and then involved in there, right? Yeah, well it started before the people were swapping out code. This Texas Instrument was obviously the landmark case. Um, so, so yeah, initially it was, a, I mean, people didn't have personal computers back in 1958. So yes, but the, you're right, it started off with the copyright. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry>? <laughs> You kind of need a crime for somebody feeling they've been wronged to take it to a court case to need data, you know, forensically sound evidence to take before the court. So it's kind of, you need something to go wrong before you can start investigating this. Is this the Computer Trespass Act? Or, not yeah. sure. Yeah? The UK one. They've got something like Computer Trespass Act uh, or something. Well, they've, they've actually, there's a couple of new, new laws I'm not familiar mm -hmm. with, but there's a couple of new laws that's come into effect with cyberbullying and that. Such. I'm not sure which one this one is. Okay, cool. I thought that the batteries might fail. <laughs> <laughs> this way? Yeah, that one. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so further to that. <coughs> Further to that, Hensler further expanded this. Um, so I'm just going to wrap these off. Not, not like in a like kind of way. Just <laughs> <laughs> I already suck with that. So. Okay, so yeah, fraud by manipulation, computer forgery, damage to or modification of computer data or programs, unauthorized access to computer systems or service, unauthorized reproduction of legally protected computer programs, like Microsoft. Um, okay, so this is on there. Um, the, slide, the slide pack will be shared, by the way. Uh, I just need to put all the correct references in. 
that because I've taken some from some of my previous lectures. Okay, so moving towards digital evidence. Okay, so in 19... Okay, so the f it was first mentioned back in 96, 97. Okay, and that's when the US Postal Service put a unit together along with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Um, and then they were actually discussing on whether um, and what would actually be classified as digital forensics or digital evidence. Okay. Okay, and then it was asked if the same standards should apply. Okay, so now we're starting to see that the question is being asked on why um, should we be using more like a scientific approach, firstly to classify what it is, and secondly, obviously, to analyze it. Okay. <coughs> and, yeah. okay. Any questions? Sorry, I'm still nervous. So, any questions? Still with us? Just don't start throwing beer bottles, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so back in uh, 2000, a clever guy called you, you and Casey. Okay, so so a clever guy called you and Casey. He's, he's quite formidable in digital forensics. You know, it's a very clever guy. Nice guy. Um, okay, so he, he took a couple of definitions to actually define what is digital evidence, okay? And he came up with a, a hypothesis that are primarily focused on proof and not paying attention to, how, um, to the data itself. Key. What? Okay, so this is the de definition which they uh, came up with. Um, as any data that can establish that a crime has been committed or can provide a link between a crime and its victims or crime as a, and its perpetrators. <coughs> okay, cool. So, ACPO, the Association of Chief, uh, Chief, Chief Police Officers. Uh, this is a document that was written by a guy called Peter Sumner. Sumner. Um, gets updated, he's a consultant, he's uh, this is the, the guide, the, the, he writes a guidebook that you can download, it's basically how to deal with uh, forensic evidence, uh, digital forensic evidence, um, collecting mobile phones and stuff. So you can download the, the, the document and go through it if you're interested. It's, um, I wouldn't say it's an interesting read, but it's a, it's a good read if you've got nothing to do if it's raining outside or something. Okay, so... That's a UK based That's correct. You familiar with it? A little bit. Yeah. <coughs> okay. But did you read it when you were studying? Yeah. Okay. It's, 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 it's probably the most well referenced <laughs> document out there. Um, okay, so. Uh, okay, so defining cyber crime. Okay, so. Cyber crime is the fun, any, any crime that is committed using a computer, network, or hardware device. Okay. And then there is. I'm still using that. <coughs> okay, so there's two types of uh, category, uh, types of uh, type. There's two categories of cyber crime. There's type one. This, this, these definitions are actually from semantic um, antivirus. Um, these are generally once-off, um, okay. uh, usually facilitated by malware or cyberware, uh, key, uh, key log, uh, keystroke loggers. This comes back to the examples. No, does it answer your question? Okay, okay software flaws, uh, uh, known vul vulnerabilities, day zero attacks, etc. Okay, and then yeah, there are some additional ones. Phishing, cash poisoning, theft or manipulation of services by hacking with, by use of a virus, identity theft, bank fraud, e-commerce, and m fraud. Okay, and then the second type is a type two. This is your more serious type of offense, such as cyberbullying, um, 
extortion, blackmail, and the likes. Um, okay, some more examples. Harassment. Where does ransomware fit in with this? Uh, this will actually fit as a top tier. Yeah. No, it's, it's blackmail extortion. Um, we don't have it on there. And the planning and carrying out of uh, terrorist attacks. Okay. Um, well, it's, yeah, it wasn't before, but I mean, there's a lot more uh, countries that are actually bringing in laws, like especially with something like cyber, uh, they're becoming quite strict in because it wasn't really classified as a, as a potentially hard, uh, hurtful crime. Um, so yeah, that is going to it is prosecuted differently. Obviously, the, the length of the um, sentences were different. You know, just um, stealing someone's Stealing somebody's um, bank account is completely different to putting them into a you know, um, So uh, some people say that it's always been a victimless crime, and now it's actually been seen as a victim. So, I don't know if that answers the question. Um, obviously, different countries. I mean, uh, it's not just South Africa is looking at the cyber laws, um, but every country is having their own challenges. Um, I think the European Union is probably dealing with it the best. In my opinion, um, but even the Americans, I mean, you would think that they'd be on the forefront, but they're also having um, challenges to to because like, computer crime evolves continuously. Um, sources also yeah, they also evolve continuously, so it, it is difficult. But it's, South Africa is no different. Yeah, South Africa is in the same boat as all the other developed countries. Cool. Any other questions? Okay, so yeah, cyberbullying, extortion, blackmail, stock market espionage, and planning and carrying out um, terrorism. Okay, so what could be put post potential sources for um, digital evidence? Any? Sorry, throw some out. Sorry? Log files. Log files, yeah, for sure. Browser history. Phones. Phones, exactly. GPSs, anything that's got a, got a chip basically, anything that has a type of memory. Sorry? No, it's browser history. Browser history, yeah, browser history. No, browser history is a very good source. How to make a bomb. <laughs> can't dispute that one. <laughs> so, so, yeah, browser history. Yeah, it's all right. Like, people, you have a history of activity that Google shows you all the activity that Google you can go and see what it is that they collect on you. Mm. So, you know, it's, if that's already the, it's a known activity that you will get the other sources of information that's lost. So, yeah, um, yeah. Somewhere under Google's activity tracking as well, there's um, they keep track of every single voice command you've ever issued to Google now. <laughs> Your recorded voice, you can play it back on their uh, website. You can also manually go and delete it. I don't remember the exact URL for it, but it's somewhere under their logging of, of your activities, if you have an Android phone with your um, user account logged in or whatever. So they record everything, basically. But you, they do, yeah. you can play it back. Yes. But the thing is, the funny thing is they give you the privacy settings, you can switch it off, but that just means that you can play it back if it's switched on. Yeah. It doesn't mean they're not recording. It's, it's it. a right <laughs> thing. And it was kind of creepy to hear my own voice. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, on that, on that topic, so, sorry. Oh, just another source of digital evidence is like metadata, like you were talking about, sure. like phone records. So, who phoned sure. you? So, if bad people phone you, you're a suspect. Even uh, tampering, I suppose. <coughs> Sorry, say so again? So, there's a, there's a good, uh, there was a dead fun talk about uh, forensic fails that people try to cover up. For instance, like uh, striping your hard drive for zeros is a clear indication that you're hiding something. And by that alone, they can the guy out of the company because he was hiding, because it was so obvious. But that opens up a, a bigger conversation, though, because that's also right to privacy. Yeah, but if you're using company, I suppose. You know, it comes down to ownership of those things. So, yeah. I mean, you can, if, you, if you're married with the community, you can get your wife's call details. Right? It's not illegal if you're married in community. Oh, okay. Um, but you're on the topic of, of Google. European Union has actually taken Google to task and uh, 
uh, the one big thing is that you have a right to be forgotten. So yeah. if you delete your accounts and stuff, then you no longer are searchable. So it's not, it is changing. I think people are becoming more aware, especially after the whole NSA thing with, with, with the iPhones and that. I think people are becoming more aware that uh, the type of information that, that uh, anybody could be, uh, could be available to anyone. And it, uh, I think it is changing. But I mean, <laughs> Chris too raises a good point, you know, it's to say that, not to say that they're still not, they might, might still be collecting that type of information. So if you go back uh, about three years, Google was uh, doing the uh, applications the, the street view car was driving around and picking up every open Wi-Fi point that it had along the way, picking up all that information they could suit for that. <coughs> and if you look at, like, for instance, Brexit, it's actually interesting because you consider that the British DCHQ is the most prolific, except for the NSA data capturing uh, apparatus where a lot of other countries like Belgium, Switzerland, uh, Netherlands, they're all very pro-privacy, protecting privacy. I mean, um, Pirate Bay has only been along, around so long because their country is so free, where uh, the, the, the British are sort of the opposite of that. And the European Union actually fights for privacy and protections, and getting out is sort of also a good idea if you want to spy in Iran. I don't know, did you see, I didn't really see Wall Street in the last months, you know, the journals of the journals, uh, sort of independent uh, journals, um, topical news, uh, South Africa's publications. They had an article on Google, we had a number of the guys uh, uh, quoted in the article, and one guy saying that uh, Google was actually seen funded by the CIA. Uh, uh, and then they are, and, and uh, yeah, looking at the guys that were quoting, you know, they, they, you know, you had Snowden in there, you know, and, uh, yeah, a number of big names. So I wouldn't put it past them. I mean, if you're looking for uh, you know, data gathering, you know, private uh, commerce is the way to go. Mm -hmm. You know, you can get people to sign up to it voluntarily. So, uh, it's it's the same conversation with uh, sending an army in a country versus sending black water in. The accountability is much less. Your accountability is only to the stakeholders, to the board, and potentially to your users as they find out where a, a government is accountable to so much more. You've got the judiciary, the voters, there's a hundred other things. Unless you're the UK, you don't even have a constitution. <laughs> yeah. That's good. good. Okay, so there's lunch, so there's some telephone records, there we go. Um, okay, emails, internet activity logs, exactly what you're saying. Sorry. Yo. I see emails on there with emails. <coughs> yeah. Um, just given the ease of the call with which you can modify those things, what, is it just like anything that looks like an email can be treated as digital images? No, it's, it, look, let's see, that comes back down to scientific method, okay, so, um, and you need to prove that, that uh, we'll, we'll get to scientific method and, and, and chain, chain of custody, um, but I haven't touched on it yet, but what, what you do with digital evidence is, is you, you create a hash code to prove that that, or when you gather the evidence, um, we'll touch on it right at the end, um, but you, when you gather the evidence, you take a hash code, um, that hash code is part of your affidavit, which is submitted to the court. Um, and anybody, if anybody takes the same piece of evidence, gets a different hash code, you cannot say that that is exactly the same piece of evidence that you gathered right at the beginning. Um, yeah. yeah, so that's either the one is like after it's been collected, has it been modified? And I suppose yeah. you're going to say the count or the other argument is so you collected this from my computer, but some hacker dude or some other person planted it there, right? So normally when you send an email, somebody receives it. So there is actually a, a check so that you can check. Yeah, so I mean, if you check the time stamp that is modified and you see like, oh, what did I get the server logs to see, yes, the email went through here at that time, and you find the recipient, and the recipient's message matches your computer that sent it, well then your computer definitely sent it. Whether you were the person who sent it using the computer is another kettle of fish, but you know. 
know, so I mean, you also have exactly what Lime's saying is you could have, um, you there, there could be a record on on the server. Um, so, I mean, the hash code is, I mean, it's uh, you get different types. Of, we download software to make sure that it's actually downloaded correctly. I mean, for the chances of you changing a piece of evidence and getting the exact same hash code is. Almost zero chance. I'm not saying it's impossible. It's, it hasn't been done, so <laughs> so it's, it's pretty impossible. There's some smart guys out there. Um, so yeah. So uh, yeah. Even even if you if, even if you work for um, insta, uh, institution in the US with three letters, you probably still haven't got it. Okay. Okay. So geotagging. This comes back to. Geotagging, this comes back to, uh, to metadata. Geotagging puts in your GPS coordinates, um, which, which is scary, really. Um, they did a, just to give you an idea, they, did a, um, they went and pulled someone's photo off, off a social media website, and they actually looked at the metadata. It was metadata put in by a BlackBerry phone. It's uh, on by default. BlackBerry has since, has since changed it. And they actually took the GPS coordinates and drove to the child school. This is my child on the first day. So I mean, it just shows you what, what's, I mean, there's, there's people out there that obviously look at this stuff. So I mean, it's, it's scary stuff. Uh, if you, but it's just like the same thing as the Google stuff. If you don't know it's on, mm. um, then, then I mean, you're not aware of it, right? Mm. So it's just to show you, I mean, that the information's out there. If you're willing to sift through it or willing to write code to sift through it, I mean, you can, you can probably pull some pretty impressive Details, private, private details. So yeah, yeah, people have to be more aware of of the information they're putting up. For sure. Okay, GPSs, digital storage device, hard drives, flash drives. Um, flash drives, incidentally, they, they tried uh, in the states. They try to see the the easiest way to break into a company. So they drop flash drives in the parking lot. <laughs> Employees picked it up, plugged it into the company. The company notebook to see who maybe whose who's flash drive it was, and then they open a the back door for the for the hackers. So it's not, uh, it's not you can have the best systems in the world. You know, sometimes the easiest solution to get in is, 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 is something that they thought. I mean, I, I personally think the guys that think of these 419 scams and stuff, they're, they're intelligent people. You know, if they just applied their, their mind right, they could achieve so much. Um, and obviously, printers. Even printers are interesting because. Yeah. Well, actually, more surprising than that, is you could probably go Google it. It's, uh, what they did was they went and bought a company, also in the States, they went and bought think, about 12 printers from an auction. And they happened to pick about five or six that were from a police station. <laughs> a lot of your, 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 um, your big printers have a hard drive. So they took a forensic image of that. They could see people's identity documents, their social security numbers. The copies of their driver's license, uh, medical bills in the states, obviously medical bills, uh, medical details. Um, and on the one printer that they opened, there was actually a paper copy of one of the criminal records, like still on the glass. So, yeah, it's once again it comes back to you know where's your where's your, your, your weakest link. It's unfortunately, sometimes it's your stuff. I mean, you think of the police station, right? <laughs> they would, they'd be a bit more careful. Yeah, okay, so let's go down to scientific method, maybe. This is where you, you know, sorry, is there any questions? Well, thanks for interacting, I love it. <laughs> then I don't have to talk. <laughs> 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 it makes it, makes it easier for me, less, less stressful. Okay, so, uh, so scientific method is, is this comes kind of down to, if someone takes the same piece of evidence, they need to be able to come to the same conclusion. Um, and everyone, you always, uh, as a scientist, uh, as a digital forensic, or as a forensic examiner, you need to come up with a hypothesis and obviously test that hypothesis. But it's not so much just doing that. You have to test every alternative hypothesis as well to basically say that the hypothesis that you've posed and the evidence points to is in fact the correct one. Um, 
because at the end of the day, that's what you're going to be presenting in a court of law or uh, in the civil court or whatever. Just on that, uh, I don't know how it works, but like in the UK, this is the current the investigator or uh, the forensic expert. Separate rules, so you know, forensic expert won't look at trying to decide what was happening, what went, you know, it's trying to deal with any sort of hypothesis on that side of the point of view, but actually just what's, what's there, uh, what are the facts, and then the actual, yeah, what might have happened, was this person guilty, was this person doing something left up to another party who is not involved in the data collection. Um, so there's sort of separation of duties. He's not an investigator, he's not there to make an opinion. Yeah, I got, um, yeah, okay, I hear what you're saying, but uh, that's all comes up to what I'll touch on just now, the CSI fact. Um, but you, you still present the evidence as an examiner. So you will present the evidence. Um, yeah. It's not, you obviously can draw yeah, your own conclusions from it. Yeah. Uh, uh, CSI tends to work together. Uh, yeah, there's a, I'll touch on the CSI factor as well. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's basically the scientific method. Essentially, what the scientific method comes down, boils down to is that you come to the same conclusion every time you run the test. And obviously, with the additions of new uh, digital evidence, a couple of years back, you considered the iPods, and you know, everything evolves. Um, with smartphones are getting smarter, tablets, and that stuff. And, and obviously, the way to um, collect the evidence and to preserve it, analyze it, it also changes. Uh, you get live forensics, which analyzes RAM uh, on the computer to get passwords, especially for encryption and stuff, is to pull passwords from a live machine. And there's obviously different um, scenarios when you would remove power from the machine and not. It's not just the one size fits all. Um, but they have to be tried and tested. I guess uh, things like uh, cloud have made your lives easier as well. Um, you know, now you can't take a physical hard drive out of a server or something like that. Now you're sitting with um, you know, something digital somewhere that's uh, effectively potentially um, in another country. Yeah, uh, but a lot of the a lot of the European and, and uh, American-based uh, cloud service providers, they will provide you with the stuff if you present them with that. Uh, oh. But yeah, I mean, a lot of your file, file sharing sites are in the, in the Eastern Bloc, so good luck with that. <laughs> but, I mean, it, it, it could be as easy as uh, one person uses the same password for everything. <laughs> you can you could get it as long as you can say how oh, you got hold of that hold of the evidence. Um, you need to be able to prove that that evidence is what you say it is, and not somebody else. Sure. In that case where you say the person used the same password everywhere and you use the password to log in and get the files, how are you going to prove that someone else didn't also use the same password to put the files there? Exactly. Well, that's the thing. You need to be, be sure. I mean, there could be a locally file, uh, stored file. So, I mean, it, it's a case by case thing. So yeah, it's, but that, that's not you're absolutely right. Um, but yeah, but, uh, you, you can you go back to browser history. If it's something like Dropbox, or something like that. it could be a login Dropbox. That you could have I think you better get Same sort of logic applies to the true crime. Uh, somebody could have tampered with it. You know, is that feasible? Uh, because, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, somebody panicked up in my car, in my house, we use the same logic. And you say, yeah, somebody else could have got in there. So, for example, um, you say, like, uh, there's a person and they've you know, been accused of a crime, you figure out they're using the same password everywhere and you find they've got this, whatever, virtual server sitting in the cloud and you log in using that password, but you go look at the history of all the logins and like since this person was taken to custody, nobody logged in. And like for that, see where the logins came from, oh, they came from the IP, that was from his ISP. So unless somebody's logging into his virtual machine from his house, and this is again hypothetical, but if you looked at the evidence, you might find things showing you that nobody else had tampered with it. So. Or they really that good. 
Yeah, or, or it's you, the <coughs> forensic investigator. Um, <laughs> but you see what I'm saying, you can look for other sources. We're talking about the like, timelines, looking, okay, oh, this guy is now in jail, <laughs> waiting his court date. Um, he's obviously not logging in. Nobody else is logged in. The next person logged in is the forensic examiner. Maybe it's under video showing what he's doing. Therefore, he can't tamper or whatever. Maybe there's a witness watching what he's doing or, or whatever. You know, there's always the checks and balances. Okay, well, so not, I shouldn't say always. <laughs> There's the ability or the capability that there could be something that could corroborate what you found. And the guy behind uh, Silk Road, uh, Dread Pirate Roberts, uh, uh, mm. he got caught red handed basically. Uh, because they, you know, to try and track him, you know, he, he was very clever, he was you know, going through the wood servers, you know, covered his tracks really well, but they managed to catch him red handed on a broken mm. actually on the machine. Mm. And, you know, otherwise, I looked back and he had originally used his actual identity to start yeah. publicizing exactly. the, the site so they could link him that way and then so they, they actually went further and further back in time so when he didn't start he didn't start off covering his tracks really well but you would assume that if he had then he wouldn't have caught it basically yeah yeah something that I'm wondering about well, what's your opinion about the Tor browser? Because that uses well, some illegal material can go through your computer, but mm -hmm. you're not sharing or like you're knowingly not an active party yeah. except for having the Tor browser. Yeah, but That's if you choose to be a, if you choose to be a relay, does that make you guilty by default? So the problem with Tor is that a US court recently ruled that Tor was equal to the definition of malware. What? <laughs> because it facilitated a cybercrime. The hiding of this person's identity. But that's future. like saying if you if, if uh, somebody who drives a vehicle can ride over yeah. somebody, that means everybody who owns a vehicle is all of a sudden guilty by default because they can drive it. Yeah. I understand that, but I'm saying that that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like it's, a, it's an idiot correction. I, mean, I think the pro British are probably also just as guilty. So the British if you, have if a you've got Reaper, which is, is ridiculous, and that uh, if you uh, if this you of something, I mean they uh, can lock you up and demand that you give you a password. Yeah. And if you don't give you your password, so you can incriminate yourself. Didn't they want to do the same thing in South Africa? It's not the law, but the, the problem is, is that. Uh, most cyber law is based on Roman law, and Roman law is based on I stole something from physical, you know, things. Yeah. And if you read the cyber law, and it's changed a little bit, but a lot of it was the onus of truth. So you are guilty until proven innocent. I mean, taking the scientific method and everything that you've learned, how, how correct is that concept that you're guilty even before you've proven? I think, look, in South Africa, definitely, I think our constitution is pretty robust. Um, so, yeah, I think you've got a lot more liberties. We have more rights here, for sure. Yeah, yeah but for the now. problem is this is a new so. law that they're trying to push in, where the wording essentially says that you are guilty even before you've gone to court. That's what I was talking about. Like, the, the yeah, problem but is... They the say that that's against the constitution, so mm -hmm. that would never pass. Again, yeah. for now. Firstly, you have, a lot, you have a right to... Uh, you, have a, you, have a, you have a right to be protected. You have a right to uh, be presumed innocent. You have a right to legal counsel. That's so in the Constitution. The well, the UK, the UK is, uh, look, is exactly what you're saying. Is if you don't give your password, then you get locked up for two years. And you see, that, that's how they're dealing with encryption, because there's no, there's no crack for encryption. So that's, that's, their, that's their answer. But I mean, if, you, um, if you're a pedophile, sure, they should shoot you. But if you'd rather go to jail, as for not giving your password and go to jail for 15 years being a pedophile. So you need to, I mean, as a, as a criminal, you're going to have to be weighed up to, okay, I'm not giving you my password. But obviously that's their reaction, reaction to it. And every country is dealing with it differently. Um, the European Union is dealing with it better in, in the sense that they, they're trying to uh, do the cross-border cross investigations a lot better by <coughs> setting up um, databases for cross-border uh, <coughs> crimes, uh, computer crimes, uh, computer uh, fr uh, forensic scientists have to be registered, they have to maintain the registration. Uh, in Holland it's law by, uh, in 
So in the Netherlands, by law, you have to be registered with the National uh, Forensic Examiner Board, and you uh, have to give four affidavits every year to maintain that. You cannot present evidence in court if you're not registered. And that's how the, how the Dutch are dealing with it. I think it's fantastic. Um, obviously, because uh, I think we're better off being South Africa, where, we, where you are tried by a judge. A judge actually analyzes what's been presented from the prosecution and from the defense. Um, in the States, I mean, a lot of people get off because it's really, it's a show. And you've got 12 of your peers, they say it's, it's fair, but I mean, if you look at the O.J. Simpson case, I mean, that, that was a show. And that's why he got off. And it's the same with Casey Anthony. You know, a judge would probably never have come to that same conclusion. Mm. And the same with O.J. Simpson, a judge would never have come to the same conclusion. So, obviously, every legal system is different. Everything is exactly what Chris is saying. Everything's based back all the way back to um, the Roman times. And I think everyone's battling to deal with it. Definitely. Right, yeah, sure. Just to go back to the uh, tour exit note thing. So. If you're running a tour exit node, it's then... It's the onion route, so it's a web browser. Yeah. yeah. He does it. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so you said tour, like as if you're no, like... No, I said tour, like, like, yeah. like as in all. Oh, okay. So, also. Yeah. so um, just to go back to that, if you're running a tour exit node, then sorry. technically you're facilitating uh, information to be passed through secretly or privately, if you prefer. Uh, so privacy can be used to keep good things private and it can be used to keep bad things private. So. I mean, right there, I'd say, well, you know, if you're going to say that's a bad thing, university, it's only going to be used by terrorists and pedophiles. What about whistleblowers, you know, and people trying to do good things with it, like journalists? Uh, hang on a sec. Um, so I would think it would fall under very much the same category of running an ISP. Yeah. If you're running an ISP. <laughs> say again? People selling clips. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I mean you know, the point. You can close the curtains. Yeah. And do nasty private things by <laughs> eventually you're going to be tried under the same laws as an ISP yeah. in traffic. And there are there is some existing laws in certain parts of the certain parts of the world, certain countries of the world, where they talk about uh, I think it's open carrier, I think it's in the States, safe harbor provisions. So as I recall, as long as they um, will respond to a warrant and provide uh, you know information on a particular user when there is like a warrant from the court, then they're all right. Or, for example, if there's a copyright infringement, if like it's being hosted on one of their servers and distributed, as long as they actually respond to that and say like, okay, like, whoa, 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 Mr. Subscriber, you should not, or Mr. Subscriber, whoever, you should not be sharing this copyright information, then they're in the clear. Um, if they say, no, we're not going to stop this person from doing it, we're not going to sh uh, shut down this file sharing, then they're facilitating a crime at that point. So, yeah. You see what I'm saying? It's a hairy, tricky balance or tricky argument to make either way. But <laughs> yeah. So on, on the tour question, right? You're facilitating traffic. But if you remember Bit, uh, Bitcoin was used in software quite prolifically. Hmm? Every time Bitcoin transactions done, the network does a validation of the traffic and it consensus on that. Are you then party to that crime? If you are if you running a Bitcoin miner that actually validates the traffic that was used on Bitcoin the silver. I would say no, but I'm not trying to like uh, convict everybody and, and pull everyone into like a drag me to get my way to convict this but guy who's the bad guy. But if you knew that transaction was coming from Silk Road, would you then veto that transaction? But how would you know that? You couldn't. Yeah. Well, but Taurus is saying. Exactly. Well, Taurus is saying. Yeah. But here, here it comes down to something. Uh, while we were busy uh, working against the cyber law, working with, uh, what's his name? Yeah. yeah. With him because he's a he's an advocate. The interesting things he said, for instance, was what he deals with. He deals with like Audrey Standard, for instance, in court. They'll have a forensic expert, but the problem is that the other experts, other people bring in, is a guy with a Microsoft certification, first level. I can't remember what it's called. Yeah. Or the other problem is that he was still in a very like much like you know I said the Roman law. Our court systems are still paper, right? Very yeah, much still digital paper evidence paper. has to be presented on paper. Absolutely. And we're talking digital forensics. Digital being the key word, but you have to get your digital evidence onto paper, take it to court, and explain it to a judge. You just print my logic. He still struggles to get all his emails in the right place, and after it goes down every now and then, he gets hacked. I mean, I know, I know a girl who's, um, who's a candidate attorney 
and the other day they got like whatever hacked or whatever like her explanation was very vague but i mean like if you want to target anyone target the lawyers right because they don't know shit but yeah <laughs> <laughs> Like, like that's, that's an acronym. Right? Like, so you have to, to do your job so properly because it's going to go on paper as yeah. evidence. There's another question I should like to ask. Uh, is, is, is a scientific method is an L2 theory? Well, that's the thing. That's what scientific method is. Is that, that it's um, uh, reproducible? It has to be reproducible. But yes, it, it is, has to be pure. That's the whole thing. It must be you must be able to do it time and time again. Mm -hmm. what's, what's, what's what now? Okay, but what you, you see, there's, there's something that's called the Dobit effect, um, so which, which actually software has to be done through that because of there was a case against the Dobit versus uh, pharmaceutical, it was against a pharmaceutical company, and it proved that basically the software was not peer period. So, um, but, uh, and that's exactly what happened in the uh, Casey Anthony case was that she, she got off because the investigator could not explain what a certain value was from the, that the software was kicking out. Um, I think that's why like, so tools like Encase are popular because they've gone she, through... She actually uh, used Encase, by the way. Uh, <laughs> only, you, know, you can't just come and say, I've written this tool to extract this and look, it shows this guy's guilty. The, if you're going to use a method to present data in court, it has to be a method that you've uh, uh, tested, that you know, you've shown to, to be accurate, uh, so using tools like NCASE, although it's not particularly great, it's not the best, uh, it's been tried and tested. They use, you know, they, they've gone to the, the trouble of actually saying this will stand up and you know, this, this is good. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, tools yeah. like that. Yeah, I would like a discussion on software. That could be a discussion on its own, to be honest. Um, but yeah, NCASE is one of the big ones. Uh, another one is access data. Uh, you get open source, I mean, that's, that's also a discussion about licensed uh, forensic tools compared to open source. Um, but you see, that's that's where the diamond effect comes in. Uh, is that the results of people and stuff. So, um, yeah. Uh, sorry, you had a question? In a case by case basis, where the evidence is not sure. No, no, not a case by case. But the method you're using. The method you're using. So, so that's much the problem with anything, right? In academics, things are peer reviewed. It gets kicked around in academics for five years. The industry picks it up. Awesome, let's do that. 10 years, 15 years down the line, this is a crap idea. Let's go look at academics again. Okay, cool. Um, this new language is going to solve all our problems. 10 years down the line, I hate this. Let's go find something else that's been kicked around in academics for five years, right? I mean, look at concurrency in programming. Like, how many different theories are there just on that? And different programming languages do pseudo concurrency, real concurrency threading. No, well, he's absolutely right. I don't know why you're looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same as a book. I mean, how long does it take to get a book published? How long does it take to get a, a technical paper published? I mean, you can you can throw out a turn out a technical paper tonight and submit it to a conference or to a journal tomorrow. Will be peer reviewed, um, but if you put that in a book, you have to get an editor, and then it gets thrown back and forth. Um, and that's exactly what you're saying. I mean, to get a book published is the, the cycle's a lot longer than to get a paper published. Um, but I mean, obviously, you've got uh, peer review panels that do f specifically for conferences and journals, but obviously, you target the ones that um, are more widely accepted than the others. I mean, you can send me your paper, I'll peer review it. But I mean, if you send it to a well-known digital forensic conference, you know, it's going to carry more water, especially because it's being peer reviewed by people that are leaders in the field. And it's like that in any field. So yeah, I don't know if you, can we, can we go on? Is there any other questions? I love it. <coughs> any other questions? Cool. Okay, so this is the flow of uh, 
uh, scientific method. We're going to go to a video now after this. So, got the question, observation, hypothesis, you test the hypothesis. Uh, if it proves true, you can support the hypothesis basically using try to test the scientific method. You write your report. If it doesn't, then you go back and review the hypothesis. And this obviously, this happens a lot more with newer technologies because uh, it's not to say that it, it worked before, it might not work so in your software or, or whatever. So it's, a, it's not a, oh shit, it's not an open loop. So it's almost like a closed loop, especially our hypothesis part, where you're testing your theories and stuff. Um, and validating, once again, validation, reliability. Two main things that your evidence has to go <coughs> Okay, so um, so tying all that stuff in, um, this is this was never intended for for what it is, but I think back to the CSI effect we touched on. Okay, so CSI effect, obviously named after the, the program uh, CSI. I think we have to Jerry Bruckheimer, executive producer. Um, he's obviously killed off the franchise, so we have to write, treat him. Time is not a crap. Bring him back. Okay, so, um, but it ties back to what you're saying, is that a criminal investigator does everything. Goes to the crime scene, takes uh, uh, swabs of blood, um, does the blood spatter analysis, does the digital forensics, um, goes out to the field, gets shot at, <laughs> dives over the edge, shoots the perpetrator. Brilliant, I mean, shit, these guys are very good shots. Um, the poor police guy in the patrol car gets shot for some unknown reason. He's not one of the main characters. Yeah, so that's basically what it is. That, uh, that you, what you see on TV is actually what it's like, and it's, it's not really like that. Okay, so um, it's a specialized job, like any, anything. I mean, someone is not someone is, is specialized in blood spat analysis, like like Dexter. I'm not saying go kill a criminal. But, I mean, you, just to give you a, like a popular culture reference. Okay. Okay, so uh, yeah. That anybody can do it, like Daniel can do it. He's an IT person. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, uh, yeah, so this specific. I mean, obviously you need to follow specific specific methods, like taking hash code and stuff like that. Because um, obviously you can dispute that. So, you know, that's right. And just get better, better, better um, sp um, experts than what the the, the uh, prosecutor has. Um, one example of that is, is, is coming back to proving that something was open. Someone was dismissed for watching porn on their computer, but they proved that the file was never actually open on the computer. It was just malware. So that file was never actually viewed on the computer. It was just obviously a pop-up closed. So the time period was too short and the person was reinstated. So, I mean, you do, and then that's the thing, is you need to look at the evidence and then and present it. So it's, it's um, questions. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to On the say, slide. okay, it's, yeah. uh, they saw that a video was only for a certain amount of time, but what software logs the amount of time that a video is open? You look at the, well, that's the thing, the coming back to, you said in case, uh, in case access data. Um, so it's forensic software, take, you, you don't actually look at the real, you don't look at the, you look, don't look at the original evidence. You take a copy of the evidence, and you actually analyze the copy of the evidence. Uh, and then you can go through all types of logs, whatever logs. Um, you can look at the uh, modification time and the access time. Access, access time, last access. Um, okay, but that only shows when it was open, not for how long. Yeah, but if you've got modification time, last access time, oh. and it's the same time, mm. and it's never been accessed again. Like, yeah. Also, many video players will potentially save your last point that file. <laughs> yeah, it also depends on the operating system. I mean, like Microsoft, they've got recent files. I mean, it's you know, seen as temporary recent files, but I mean, uh, it's not really temporary because you can go and look at your recent files. I mean, that could be a file that's three months old if you don't have an open many files in that, on that system. Um, and then also, uh, uh, okay, this, this, there's another discussion on its own with file slack, which is uh, space, uh, it's not the file itself, it's space after the file that contains information. Um, you can carve files, so if a file has been partially overwritten, obviously the file gets written to, uh, can be written to multiple sectors. Yeah. A portion of that file could have already been overwritten with new data, but you can still carve maybe 
evidence from what is still remaining, say an image or um, a file or whatever. And now obviously that's what you present. Um, but obviously the two come back down to you need to prove that it is what it is. Um, if you can explain why, the, why you had to carve it, um, that's also good. Obviously you need to explain why half the files are there or two thirds of the files are there. Okay. Okay, so <coughs> CSI effect. Um, this is also the one you people looking at phones and stuff. Uh, that's not forensically sound because you used to say that you didn't go and surf on the guy's phone for you know, how to make a bomb. Um, so yeah, that's not uh, that's not forensically sound. So you would actually take an image of the phone and you'd analyze the, the, the contents of the image, not the, the actual phone itself. Uh, you'd have to put it in a Faraday bag. There's obviously different procedures to deal with different types of evidence, how to connect it, how to store it and then you have to report on it. Okay, chain of custody. Anybody want to take a stab at chain of custody is chain of evidence, also referred to as chain of evidence. Yeah. So Read off the board. Is there <laughs> some sort of record that shows uh, who handled the evidence? Uh, yeah, well, it's basically, it's, it's, it's a timeline of what's happened. It's, it's, it all ties back to, is the evidence what you say? Like for instance, if it's a knife, used for a murder, What's, who says that knife is the knife that, commit, that was used for the murder, and how was, that, how was that knife handled from when it was collected at the crime scene to when you present that? So it's is a it real world log? It, it, it is. It's, it's a paper trail. Um, sometimes it could be disputed. Um, so yes, it's exactly it. It's, it's a trial, uh, to say the evidence is what it is. Digital evidence, you would catalog it because, um, and I think it ties back to what you're saying is that the person doing the triage when they're collecting the evidence is not necessarily the same person that's going to be analyzing or writing up the report. Okay, so, okay, so it's <coughs> okay, um, yeah, it's uh, documentation is a critical component. So you say that uh, in your affidavit you would write that this person contacted you. Obviously, you need to, it needs to be done legally, right? So uh, you're given a court order or whatever, you collected the evidence, took the hash codes, um, and obviously everything's documented. The original, or original device was put in storage. You analyzed the, the evidence so that if, if anyone, you don't do um, analysis on the live, or on the, on the original evidence, because you're going to change. Booting a machine, you're changing the file structure. You're changing access times, obviously. so you can't do that because you're changing the evidence, and it, comes, it all comes down to: is it what you say it is? Okay. Okay, and then this is this is probably the, the thing: is that um, the simplest thing is to prove with hash codes. You know, the hash code was five zero one. It is now five zero one. It is the same evidence that I collected. It's been documented. Hash codes are correct. Okay. Does metadata affect hash codes? Metadata is part of that. The, look, the hash codes the complete the entirety. It will contain your metadata. Okay. Or even like say you do uh, hash code on a, on a Word document, it will contain your metadata. If I go and change anything of that metadata, the hash codes will change. The file name doesn't. No, you can, no, well, you can hash the file name if you want to. Changing the file name will change the hash Promise. Code. Changing the file name changes the metadata, which changes the hash code. You can take an image of like a image. file system or partition, and you can run a hash code on that. You'll get a, a hash sum, and voila. You you start changing, changing anything, anything on it. Even opening the file and accessing it will change the hash code. It will change the metadata. Yeah, it will maybe change I'm the hash code. It's sharp 256, is that that's, yes, that's an example of it. I've, I've definitely, in my, I've changed the file name and it has the same chart 256. You're probably using Windows. So you, you've hashed the contents of the file. <laughs> yeah, contents of the file. Not so, the file. So, so, so don't only hash the contents yeah. of the file, is uh, the answer to your okay. question. Okay, cool, I didn't know about that. Okay, so that's that. <coughs> okay, almost done. Any questions? Okay. Any questions? okay. Okay. So, <coughs> this is a forensic process, pre-examination phase, examination phase, post-examination phase, it's pretty slow. Um, and then 
you've got in the, within your different phases, you've got sub subcategories, pre-examination phase, legal authority. Obviously, it's your wife. <laughs> so yeah, you must you obviously have authority to do it. Um, civil cases, you need an Anton pillar. You can't just go and collect some of this. But it ties back into what you were saying about who's, who's, who's the property it is. I'm working for a company, it's the company's property. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a tough one. And I understand you have a right to privacy, but it is still the company's note. So if you're doing something that's against the company's policy, you don't really have a link. Yeah, well, considering if it's like under policy, then it's understandable. Look, I mean, they're not going to go after you because they don't like you. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, you know, I mean, that can happen. open up a whole lot of legal problems for many people involved. Exactly. Okay, so, yeah, legal authority, identify legal elements, digital evidence, devices, acquisition, authentication, hash codes. Key. Examination phase. You have, to uh, you have to confirm the examination parameters. You can't just go on a, wall, uh, on a fishing trip to see, okay, well, this guy's not guilty of, okay, 12 points probably. The guy's not guilty of fraud. Let's see what else he's guilty of you know, while we've got the evidence. You can't do that. Um, you can't go and search for anything. If the person's only, for argument's sake, uh, cyberbullying, being charged with cyberbullying, say, lion, you can't go and look at who else has been cyberbullying. It's not without, it's out of the, the parameters. I don't know if this would be uh, an exemption to that rule. If you were saying, you were just like a computer repair guy in a shop, and you took somebody's laptop and you found child porn on there, you have uh, a duty in the UK at least, well, it's a to, to, uh, to actually report that, and if you don't, the you like it, just as like well. yeah. So, I mean, no, he's absolutely right. It's, uh, it's the same in South Africa. Even a, as a forensic investigator, if you are, if you are investigating a crime, even for fraud, and you find child porn, you have to stop. You're not even allowed to. You're, you're, allowed to you're not even allowed to have that, that yeah. in your possession. Yeah. You have to take it to the police. It's, it's sort of back to classic law that the uh, uh, court order, right?